there is a, a charity which is based in New York, but which funds overseas and implements projects on wild cat conservation all over the world. Our mission is to secure a future for the world's cats. In Asia, we, we do work on, on tigers and snow leopards, Latin America on jaguars and North America on mountain lions and then here in Africa on, on lions, cheetahs and, and leopards. Also look after their habitat, the prey that they need. We've taken a holistic approach to that. Panthera is a conservation organization. Ultimately everything we do needs to lead to us being able to better protect leopards and other cat species. So leopards, I guess, like many apex predators, they are an umbrella species. If you protect leopard, you're protecting a vast amount of other biodiversity underneath them. They need large tracts of land to be able to be protected. They fulfill a key role in ecosystems that sort of right, but right at the top of the food web. So you have these knock-on effects. If you can successfully conserve carnivores by virtue, you are looking after a whole host of other animals and plants below them. Leopards are from a conservation sense a useful model to use for different conservation approaches because they occur both inside and outside of protected areas um, and they often occur in much closer proximity to people than many other large carnivals. They really are right at the interface of some of the conservation challenges, the conflicts that we face when trying to look after other large carnivals and, and so that means we can test different approaches using leopards that would be much harder with things like tigers which are more endangered more isolated to protected areas, the same is true for lions, etc. So not only are they an important umbrella species, they are an important species for allowing us to test different types of conservation interventions. Kirkman's in this area is unique. This is one of the few places where the cats are effectively protected. For the most part, they're not. And we've seen at a cross leopard range, populations are in real trouble and, and, and probably as much trouble as, as other more endangered species that people might be more aware of, things like lions, tigers, rhinos, all of these species are very much in the public limelight. Mm. People are aware that there they are conservation issues with these particular species, but with leopards they often seem to fall off the conservation radar. They almost assume that because they can survive in closer proximity to with, with people that, that their conservation status is assured. It doesn't really matter what happens, they will be able to bounce back. But but as our information about leopard populations improve, we realize that, that this is not the case, that in many places they're in trouble. So I guess it was almost an accident that I, I landed up working on leopards, but, but that was almost 20 years ago, and, and I have loved every moment since. My first boss and my PhD supervisor uh, was an Australian by the name of Dr. Luke Hunter. Luke had done his PhD on Pinda when it was first formed. He worked on the reintroduction of, of lions and cheetah, uh, into Pinda at that, at that time we knew very little about how to reintroduce cats. Um, now it's a sort of a tried and tested method pioneered by the work that, that people like Les Carlisle um, and Luke did bringing these cats in and working out how to ensure that they could um, successfully survive in a new environment. Kevin Pretorius who was the reserve manager at Pinda at that time um, uh, reached out to Luke and said that they were, had concerns about the leopard population. They were worried about some of the persecution in, in neighboring areas and would he be interested in, in carrying on with his work on cats in the reserve but here looking at, at what impacts that persecution was having on Pinder's leopards and, and how could we rectify that situation. And, um, and then I stepped in as the very keen and willing um, research assistant to Luke. So it's just continued from there onwards. When the project first started, we didn't actually know what the main drivers of population decline in Pinda was. Numbers just to continually de decrease there. The guides, they would habituate a cat and finally start being able to view leopards in that area and then that cat would disappear. So we, we started the more intensive research to try find out, okay, what's going on. We put radio collars on, um, on lots of leopards. At that stage, it was by far the most extensive research program that ever happened on the species. We called it over 70 leopards in the end. Um, we also ran camera trap surveys uh, to be able to estimate leopard population densities. And then because we repeated these every two years, we could see how uh, the population trend changed, how, how numbers changed over time. And it soon became very clear that the population was in in steep decline and we were able to work out why because we had this, this intensive data on how long leopards were living for and, and when they died what was the cause of death. Interestingly in the early years it, it seemed to be more related to just poorly managed trophy hunting and problem animal control. We took the data and we worked with the provincial authority in the area. They absorbed all this information and they, they changed their policies. As soon as hunting and problem animal control policies changed we saw numbers started to rebound. So within a few years, that pinder population had almost doubled in size. But then it started to drop off again, 
And again, just because we continued the research, that program ran for over 10 years. So we were able to see now it was more poaching of leopards, so snaring of cats, targeted poisoning of cats. And when we did some further investigation, we will find out that the reasons that leopards were being poached was primarily for their skins. Amongst different uh, ethnic groups here in South Africa, um, for ceremonial work. So, so leopards have always played a very important role in, in some cultures. Wearing of leopard skins is a symbol of power. So it used to be limited to just a few individuals. And unfortunately, those cultural taboos on who could and couldn't wear leopard skins has changed over time. And, and now, almost anyone is wearing these skins. And, um, and this was really evident with a, a, a religious group known as the Nazareth Baptist Church, or Shembi Church. They had adopted leopards as their, their totem species. They wore leopard skins as a, a symbol of worship. And, and there are literally millions of Shembi worshippers. So this was a problem for leopards. Uh, demand was very high. And, and, and this is what was causing this, like I say, marked increase in poaching for the cats. A colleague of mine that, that was working with me at Pinda at the time, Tristan Dickerson, um, started working with the Shembi leadership, trying to find out like where the alternatives. And he soon realized that, that when one visited these Shembi gatherings, that you would see that, that some uh, Shembi members were, were celebrating, were dancing, using fake skins. They just couldn't afford a real leopard skin. And, and that led us on to this idea, maybe we could replace all the real skins being used by the Shembis with a, a synthetic alternative. So started the Furs for Life program um, to develop this, this synthetic garment. It's termed an amabata. It's a shoulder cape that, um, that Shembi members wear. But it's been amazing, and, it's, and because of the, this, this very close relationship that we have with the Shembi uh, leadership, we work together to say, okay, how can we address this? This is not sustainable, this sort of demand for thousands of leopards every year. Soon there would be no more of these cats. So now we, we've, we've donated, I think as of this year, about 19,000 of these faux skins to Shembi members. And you could almost think about it as every skin is a leopard saved. It is very rare in conservation that you have a, a nice, neatly packaged solution to a, a problem. It still has to be part of a broader package, but it, it was a remarkable success. So leopard populations across South Africa are starting to recover because some of the pressure has been taken off. And it's, it's one of the things I really love about working with, with cats is, is how quickly they can recover. So as long as conditions are suitable, they can respond and recover rapidly. When we'd finished the project at Pinda, so that ran for 10 years, um, from 2002 to 2012. So we radio collared a lot of cats. We, it was, at that time, it was the seminal study on the species. And we had learned a great deal about leopards and we'd been able to use that information to, to change policy, to improve conservation practices. Um, but there were still huge gaps in our knowledge of the species. And ultimately, if you want to protect an animal, you need to know about it, you need to know all the ins and outs about its behavior, its ecology, its evolution. And, um, and because I had always known about the Sabi Sands, like I say, I have a, a family history here, I've known about these incredibly relaxed leopards and, and importantly about how well documented the individual cats had been by the different guides and lodges, I, I realized that we had an opportunity to plug some of those holes in our knowledge about leopards. And so I started reaching out to different guides um, from and beyond and, and other lodges um, in the region and slowly but surely starting to reconstruct the life histories of the different individual leopards which have been tracked over the last 40 plus years so dating right back to the late 70s so just to give you an indication we now have life history data so we know exactly when um, individuals were born died for the most part what happened to them for over 850 leopards spatial data so we have the locations for more than 90,000 sightings over 10,000 leopard kills um, and, and comparable data on the other large carnivores in the system so on lions on, on wild dog on cheetahs and so it's not just the leopards but their competitors we have good data on the prey so it's, it has been a remarkable research project which is all on the bat of, of of ecotourism, of guides collecting the information for us. It's done very cheaply, but, it, but it's rigorous. And, and information we would never be able to achieve using other, um, I guess, research methods such as radio telemetry or camera traffic. So it is, yeah, it's a unique opportunity. There's probably only maybe two or three other cut studies and, on lions and, and cheetah, which come close to rivaling just the, the length of time that we, um, or the number of generations that we've been able to follow. 
and the number of different individuals. So in, in this long-term data, it really does give us insight into population drivers. What, what regulates leopard populations? And we need that information here in a controlled system where leopards are really well protected, when they are behaving like leopards should do. And this is now the exception, not the norm anymore. We need to have a reference population to know what they would do in natural circumstances. This is our benchmark. And so not only do we learn about the drivers, about leopard populations through our intensive research here, but we also know what we need to be aiming towards. So, so that, that we, we have different types of data that we collect through the project, um, all done by the guides. When they go out on game drive, the guides will take note of when they see leopards. We've developed a, a customized software so the guides record all the key information that we require. So which individual was seen, where was it seen, did they kill something, did they interact with another individual? Um, and so we're getting standardized data from all the different lodges um, across the reserve on all sightings. So on average, there's about 10,000 leopard sightings in the, in, in, in the Swabi Sands each year. It gives us very important demographic information. How often are leopards breeding? How often do they have um, litters? How many of those cubs survive? What are the survival rates of, of adults? Uh, what are the main causes of mortality? Um, also important spatial data, work out leopard, the size of leopards' home ranges, if they are preferring or avoiding particular type of habitats, how they interact with other carnivores and, and their prey within the system. So that's, that gives us some of the important behavioral and ecological data. Then to look at the population data, we, we um, run camera trap surveys across the whole reserve and that tells us more about um, what is the, the density of leopards in this area. How does density vary across the reserve with regards to different vegetation types, to distance to water, etc. Things like that. Game drives only operate at a, a certain time of day. We sort of we get a, a biased look at what is happening um, with leopards around dawn and dusk, whereas the camera traps give us a, a full day record so we can see much more about the activity. We then also um, collect genetic data. We want to see how um, leopards are related to one another, problems with inbreeding, etc. And to collect that genetic data, uh, we ask the guides to collect leopard feces for us. You can work out how related individuals are to one another. That's important within a, a spatial context. Um, so, so no, the genetic data tells us a, a vast amount. And more recently now, we're starting to collect uh, even the audio of leopards and, and use that in sort of experiments to see how uh, individuals react to known individuals versus uh, unknown individuals and, and, and what again drives various parts of their population dynamics. Even though this isn't a dedicated uh, research study, we are able to collect all those types of information that you typically would in a research study, but here using the field guides at a fraction of the cost with a successful ecotourism operation. So it really is, we get the best of both worlds. It's taken decades here in the Sabi Sands to be able to, um, to, to get the cats habituated enough that you can, you can have such regular sightings. It's wonderful that the Kirkmans, that, um, that this, this area, this reserve, is not only the place where, I guess, leopard viewing is at its best and, and where you've been able to bring leopards back up into public awareness, but it's also now with the science and the sort of partnership we have with and beyond and the other lodges, it's where we're learning most about the species.